well, thank you, everyone. Uh, let's thank you for coming to my talk on the functional reactive programming with Elm. For today's talk, we're going to go through, a, I'll have a very quick introduction to Elm and the functional reactive paradigm, and then we're going to look at some of Elm's basic syntax and language features. And at the end, we're going to have a little quick demo building a game uh, from scratch in Elm. My name is Yen Chui, and I often go by the online alias of the Burning Monk because I'm a big fan of Rage Against the Machine, the best fan ever. I work for a company called Gamesys. Um, we are based in central London, and uh, we are one of the market leaders in the real money gaming business. But my team, we focus on a more soft core social game, so our audience is slightly different from the rest of the company in that we build games for, say, Facebook and mobile, so the type of games that you typically find on those platforms. By trade, I'm a backend developer, and I'm building uh, the backend for a number of our games today, which has uh, around a million daily active users. And uh, so, just so you know, I'm not an expert in Elm. I have spent quite a lot of time with Elm in my spare time because it's something that's of interest to me. But uh, I'm not associated with him in any way. I'm not behind the language in any case. So what you're gonna find today is gonna be my personal opinions and views based on my experience with Elm so far. If you haven't heard about it here before, uh, Elm is a very young language that's built on top of the Haskell platform. The code you'll be writing will be compiled to HTML and JavaScript. So it's designed for the web. And uh, it, is, it describes itself as a functional reactive language for interactive applications, which begs the question of what is functional reactive programming. And for me, I think the easiest way to describe it is to having value over time, meaning that if you can capture the time axis with your data structure, then you not only have a point in time snapshot of what the value for your thing is, but rather the whole entire history of all the values it's had in the past. In Elm, this is called a signal. And another way to think about it is uh, if you capture state using cameras, so you, have, uh, you, so you just have a uh, point in time snapshot of your uh, state, so loads of things could have happened between your snapshot, so you have no idea how Mr. White turned into Heisenberg. But on the other hand, if you capture state using a video camera, you have a complete history of your state changes, and you end up with five glorious seasons of Breaking Bad. And of course, you can't really talk about reactive programming nowadays without talking about this man, Eric Meyer, who is the father of uh, reactive extensions and also known for his very colorful t-shirts. Um, reactive extensions is now very popular. It's been adopted in many different languages and, by, and used heavily by many companies such as uh, Netflix. And in the recent talk, and this is what Eric Meyer said right at the end, that reactive is dead, long live composing side effects. Now, if you watch the talk, Eric wasn't trying to queue off reactive programming or IX for that matter. He was just pointing out the fact that the very definition and understanding of reactive programming, the term itself, is so convoluted and misunderstood that the definition in Wikipedia basically just says reactive programming can mean just about anything. And uh, if you consider the recent reactive manifesto, which I think is great in a way because uh, it, it's getting people to talk about interesting and desirable system characteristics that the Erlang guys has been talking about for years and decades, in fact. But it's also now associated all these interesting characteristics of a system with reactive programming, which just means that, well, Wikipedia was right after all. Reactive programming does just mean just about anything. So. As, uh, uh, as Eric Meyer said, let's just forget about the term itself. Let's just focus on the thing that's important here, which is how do we manage state in a way that is sane and allow us to manage complexity. Which brought me to something that I saw David Thomas wrote a little while back as he was learning Elixir himself. He said that one thing I'm discovering is that transforming data is easier to think about than managing state. Which is, for me, is one of the key differences between the imperative style of code and functional style of code, where in the imperative world, your state is mutated in place. This has the obvious limitation that as you have more and more state you need to manage to understand what your application is doing, you have to take all that information into your head and build up a mental model of what your application is going to do. And from psychology, we know that our active our active memory can hold a very small number of items at a time. We can cheat by using techniques such as chunking, which the chess masters do, but uh, I don't know how well that applies to programming. And uh, if you take a very simple example I found when I was looking at the uh, OpenFL framework for hacks for, uh, for a game jam we did recently, this is a very simple game of Pong where the user can control the, the bar on the left with up and down uh, mouse, well, with the up and down arrow keys. So, 
the code you find will have something very similar to the sort of thing that you typically see in the games where you have a global variable that tracks when, say, the mouse key up and down key has been pressed as well as the state for your bar. In this case, it's called a platform. So when the key down ha event happens, you inspect what key was pressed and you set the corresponding Boolean value to two and you do the reverse when the key up event happens. And on every frame, so if you are playing the game at 20 frames a second, then this function gets called 20 times a second. You check your Boolean flags and then you update the state accordingly. And you also have to cap the, 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 the Y value so that your bar doesn't fall out of the screen. Even from this very simple example, you see your state, your, man, your managing state changes in a number of different places, and some of these ch state changes are dependent on other changes happening ahead, well, before as well. So you can't really think about individual state changes in isolation. You have to have the whole picture in your head to understand what is going to happen. And you need to do that to understand what your application is going to do when you actually run it, which for me is where the complexity and the challenge comes in as your application becomes more and more complex. But for this particular game, this is, a, this is the mental model I actually have when I think about what my application should be doing. So when a certain input happens, be it the user input or time, my state has to change from one to, to another version, and I maybe have to do, do something by drawing the state on the screen, for example. But notice that this mental model is not describing state change or how to manage it. It's describing, stage, uh, it's describing transformation how given a certain input, how I should transform state from one, one version to another. Which with functional programming, your focus is now shifted from uh, managing state into doing managing transformations and functions, they just give you a mapping from the old state to the new state. And amongst many other things, I find that the, this allows you to break up a bigger problem into smaller, simpler uh, problems that you can solve independently and if you're, if these smaller pieces are solved correctly, and when you compose them together at the end of it, your whole application should also behave correctly as well. So let's see how we can apply, uh, apply the same reasoning to the example we saw earlier. So this is the code I would write in Elm instead to solve the same, to implement the same logic, where I define the state for my platform, the bar, and uh, as well as the default state where it starts with. And then I sample the keyboard arrow keys on, well, 20 frames a second in this case. Um, which gives me a signal, a stream, a constant stream of values with X and Y according to which it depends on which key is pressed. And then starting with the default state, five in, uh, X for five and uh, zero for, for Y, for every input I get, which I now pattern match into the X and Y value, given the current state I have, which, which for the first input would be your default state, I, I Take a cl I take a copy of the current state, I clone it, and update the Y value using the syntax on the right there. And I make sure that I cap that value so that uh, it doesn't fall out of the screen, just like we did before. Don't worry about the syntax for now. We're going to go, we're going to have a more comprehensive uh, walkthrough of the syntax so that the hopefully by the end of it, you will be more comfortable with this type of syntax you see in Elm. So, Elm signal also, well, uh, other, other language and frameworks also have the same concept of a signal for this constant stream of uh, values for, that you can, you can capture. In reactive extensions, it's called an observable. In Dart, it's called a stream. They have, whilst they are quite similar conceptually, they have different uh, well, intricacies. Something that uh, um, Evan Sablisky has talked about in his uh, previous talk at Strange Loop, where he talked about the different approaches to functional reactive programming. There are some differences uh, in terms of whether or not these uh, streams can be, uh, can be constructed at runtime and composed together at runtime. In the case of Elm, they all compiled, everything gets compiled into a static graph, which in terms of performance has some benefits, but uh, it has some limitations in terms of how, well, in terms of flexibility. Another inspiration behind Elm is uh, Brad Victor. In particular, he's uh, inventing on print, uh, principles talk in 2012, whereby he gave everybody this demo and just blew them away. Let's, let's see. When my guy collides with the turtle, he gets some y velocity, so he bounces into the air, and the turtle gets stomped. So that looks like that. And the turtle gets up after a bit. The problem is, I don't want the player to be able to get up here yet. I want the player to bounce off the turtle and go through this little passageway down here. And I'll have to 
go around and you know, solve puzzles and whatnot, come back and get the star. So the turtle is too bouncy right now. Now, of course, I can just turn that down in the code, and now I can try it, and now it's not bouncy enough. And so while it's nice that I can kind of adjust the code while it's running, instead of having to stop and recompile and find my place again, I can't immediately see what I need to see, which is whether or not he can make that jump. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bounce off the turtle and pause the game. So I pause the game, and now there's this slider up here, which lets me rewind through time. And now I can rewind to back before I made the jump and change the code, make it less bouncy. And now when I move it forward, it's going to simulate forward using the same input controls, the same keyboard commands I recorded as before, but the new code. This is not good enough. I need to be able to see changes immediately. I need to be able to see immediately whether or not my bounciness is correct. None of this stuff. And if you have a process of time and you want to see changes immediately, you have to map time to space. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bounce off my turtle, pause the game, and now hit this button here, which shows my guy's trail. So now I can see where he's been. And when I rewind, this trail in front of him is where he's going to be. This is his future. And when I change the code, I change his future. So I can find exactly the value I need. So when I hit play, he slips right in there. He's awesome. You should definitely go watch it. Go to the website, uh, warriorsdream.com, and watch some of his other talks. They are very, very inspirational. But most of his work has been around how do we shorten this feedback loop between having an idea and being able to see it in action. And his work has inspired a lot of people, including Khan Academy's online interactive programming environment to teach kids how to program, as well as Lighttable, uh, which is an ID for uh, building closure script. And, but also, Elm's very own debugger, where you can stop the game and then make a change and see how Mario's path would have changed. And one of the interesting things is that uh, as you rewind through time, you can also see the state for Mario change at all times as well, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, in this performance, uh, I haven't done any benchmark myself, so this is just taken uh, straight from the Elms uh, blog. Uh, so take it with, with a pinch of salt as you should. But from, the, from, their, from their benchmarks, uh, at least for a to-do MVC application, it's very strong uh, compared to well, all the other frameworks out there. So that's a very high-level overview of Elm and the functional reactive programming. Now, let's look at some of the basic language syntax. Um, this is how you define a function. And uh, optionally, you can, you can specify a type signature for your function. In this case, it says that the function add takes the integer and then another integer and returns the integer. So when you see type signatures like that, the very last type is always the return value for your function. And when you need to define intermediate the results that you want to use, this is the way you do. You define the things that you want to use in the lab block, and then you use them in the in block. Uh, we say that, uh, well, in, in Elm and Haskell, that the functions are carried by default. This means that when you have a function like this, which takes multiple arguments, you can actually uh, partially apply it with, uh, with, one of the, with, uh, with one argument, and then you get back another function, which takes one argument less. And this can be applied to any, well, with functions with any number of uh, arguments that you have. And this is how you define a lambda. Uh, so you start with a slash and followed by the arguments that you have. So if you have more than, one, more than one argument, then the, the arguments are separated by space. For this particular function, you can always uh, write it with, uh, by, you can always rewrite it by using the multiply operator as a function that takes two arguments and partially apply it with the first argument of two. Tuples, nothing special here. 
In ELM, though, you can also use the comma op uh, operator as a function, which again, depending on how many comma you have, uh, you get back, it's a, it's a function that takes a different number of arguments. This is how you define a record in ELM. Um, have you guys all seen records before in different languages? Okay, anyone who hasn't seen a record before? Okay, good. Um, so a record is just a very lightweight label data structure, has no behavior, or it's just a data container, it's immutable by default as well. So to access the values for fields in the record, this is what you have to do. And in Elm, you can also use those field names as functions as well to get the value out of your fields. Uh, they are immutable, so you can't update them, but what happens if you want to do, you do want to update, have a new version, that's when you use the clone and update syntax, whereby here we're creating a new record, Y, basing on the fields that X has, except we're going to set the field name to a different value, to bar. In, well, unlike in the F-sharp and earlier, you don't have to create a type definition for your records ahead of time. So in which case, the Elm's properties, or well, Elm's records kind of behave like a property bag, but it's usually good, a good idea to give, to give them a type alias first so that you have better static guarantees and then you can also refer to the same type later on much easier. Um, besides regular records, you can also define what is called an extensible record in Elm. This has, a, compared to regular records, it has a better reusability. In this case, we're saying that for the extensible record type named, it depends on, it's a easier, 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 easier way to think about it is to just have to say, okay, I've got a record that regardless what other fields it has, it must also have a field called name, which is of type string. And later on, you can compose these extensible records together with, so here we're saying that based on the empty record, our lady here also needs to have the fields defined in the extensible records aged and then named. And when you have functions that, defend, that depend on some record, usually you have to match up, you have to match uh, all the fields that you have in your record, but for, extens for um, extensible records, you don't have to do that, which will give you the better reusability. So in this case, my function can take any record so long it has a field called named. This is a union type in Elm, uh, which otherwise also known as the sums and products data structures, which sounds a bit funny if you haven't heard about them before, but all it means is that for the type status, we actually have a number of variant types flying, exploding, and exploded. And for each of these variant types, they can have a tuple of types associated with them. So if you have seen the enums in languages like Java or C Sharp, think of, it, uh, think of these guys as just having enums, but with uh, each enum clause being tagged with an arbitrary set of types. Pipes. Um, anyone who was in the previous, previous um, um, talk would have seen pipes from uh, in Elixir as well. I uh, first came across these pipes in the uh, F Sharp, and since then they've uh, been become popular, which is a good thing, I think. So here we have a function called field that takes a color, a shape, and returns a form. In this case, we've, uh, we've partially applied it with a color that's of RGB values, 150, 170, and 150. And uh, we have another function that gives us uh, a shape. So using the pipe operator, all it does is it takes the value from the, 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 on the left-hand side and put it at the end of the next line, and so on. The thing I like about uh, pipes, uh, not only because it comes from f -sharp, but also because it supports visual thinking, which is a way to organize your information so that when people look at your, when people try to process information, they don't have to think so hard, just understand it. And on his website, uh, uh, Daniel Higginbottom wrote this line, which I thought is uh, pretty great in explaining how for whenever we read anything in English, we read them from left to right, top to bottom. But for some reason, when it comes to nested function calls and method calls, it's, completely, it's the other way around, which obviously makes it harder for us to understand because now we have to really dig in and see, okay, what's the order of execution here? But with pipes, it's restored some of that sanity and, the, and, and the match the way we naturally read things in English anyway. So the function we had, uh, so our draw function had this signature where it takes an integer, integer, and then a flow and returns a form. We can actually rewrite this function using, by rather than calling individual functions, and we can actually compose the different parts together to make a bigger function. So in this case, we have a circle function that takes a float and returns a shape. And then we can do this exercise of turning each of the functions into its type signature. 
And for the next one, we already know that uh, this is a partially applied function that takes a shape and returns a form. So using the double arrow notation, we combine these two functions together. So you can see how the the two functions, when you combine them, you give you back a function that takes a float and a form. And we can do the same exercise for the rest of the functions that we have. And to see that we actually here, we with all that stuff, we end up with a function that takes a float and returns a form. So our function, even though we've written it completely in a different style, has the same type signature. It also has, uh, Elm also has uh, support for pattern matching. We're using the case of a syntax. Uh, in this case, we're saying that for the value for the input argument name, if it's of the value yen, then the do this. Otherwise, for all other values, we don't care what other value that is. So we use underscore to as a wildcard to say, okay, we don't want to bind the value. So that's uh, what that means. Uh, unlike in Haskell or F# or a number, number of other languages, uh, Elm doesn't support the when guards yet. So when you want to have a more uh, another layer of uh, conditional. So suppose say for the, the for the input name, if it's yen and then some other condition, right now you can't express that using the when guards. So you can use the multi-way if statements instead. And uh, there's a number of uh, built-in signals in Elm uh, with uh, for things like mouse positions, clicks, and uh, as well as window dimensions and time. When you have, uh, when you're using the mouse uh, position, uh, that gives you a signal of uh, integer tuples. So any time you move your mouse, you're gonna get a new value on your signal. Similarly, when you use keyboard the last press, every time you press a key, a new value becomes available on that signal as well. You can map one signal, well, you can map uh, values from one signal into, into a different type, into another signal using the map operator. So in this case, if you wanna take the window dimensions, which is a, a tuple of, well, a signal of tuple, integer tuples, and we can use the map function, pipe it to a lambda that takes a tuple, multiplies the two different bits together. So in this case, we end up with a signal of integer values. You can do the same thing with more than one signal as an input, and in this case, there's another operator that you can use. So if we take the width and the height, which are both uh, integer signals, and then we put it into the comma operate the comma function, which is like we saw earlier, where it takes the two arguments and give you back a tuple of two elements. This, and you can see the type sort of drive you towards uh, the answer that you're looking for. And there's also map three, map four, five, and six, six, seven, and eight. And finally, we have another common operator we, uh, we use a lot, which is uh, called fold p or fold from the past, whereby we start with a, with a default state uh, for our output, and that uh, as well as a lambda that takes the the, new, the value from the input signal and the current value for the output, and give you back a new value for your output signal. So if you want to try the number of mouse clicks, we can do this, whereby we start with the number zero, and for every mouse click, we apply the lambda to increment the value n by one, n starting from zero, and we end up with a signal that tells us how many, well, of integer values. Uh, when you use a mouse, uh, sorry, keyboard or arrows, you get back a record with x and y values, that's uh, uh, with the, this mapping. There's also a number of other signals, uh, other operators you can use with a signal in terms of how do you uh, compose them together. And uh, Elm also has support for with uh, JavaScript interop as well as doing WebGL and just doing HTML layout stuff. Uh, but we won't go into those today. And what we're gonna do for the rest of the talk is build, build a demo for, of, a, of a game of Snake uh, from scratch. What we're gonna do, we're gonna start the Snake with uh, eight segments for its body and it's gonna be moving towards a certain direction, initially to the right. You can't reverse the, the movement of a snake, but you can change the direction based on the direction that it's currently moving in. And then for every frame, we're gonna draw a new, we're gonna work out where its head is gonna be for this frame. And then we're gonna trim off the last part of its body and then surgically attach the new head to the new, bo uh, to the new body to give you the illusion that the snake is actually moving on a screen. If there's a sherry on, if a sherry is a randomly spawned somewhere on the screen, and the, uh, the snake can eat the sherry with its head, and when it does, then its body grows by one segment, which in this case just translates to us not having to 
uh, remove the last segment from its old body before we attach the new head to it. And this is the standard template you get with uh, Elm when you want to build a new, a new game, where you have a section for defining your user inputs, and then a section for defining your game state. And finally, for every input, we, we apply a step function to say, okay, given this input and the current game state, give back a new game state to me. And using fold P, starting from, from your default game state, we're gonna have we're gonna end up, end up with a signal of game states, which we can then render on then we can then render on screen. And finally, in Elm, every uh, well, you have to have a main, which is uh, something that you, which tells Elm this is the thing that you should be drawing on screen. In this case, it's a signal of elements, so that whenever you get new value available on the on the on your main here, uh, you get drawn on this on the screen. So let's do that then. Can you guys see this okay? Okay, cool. So the first thing we need to do is we define our user's input. Uh, in this case, we're going to capture the arrow key when someone presses the arrow key, which we know has the shape of x and y value as integers, or whenever they press space to start the game. And our default user input, I uh, would say that is going to be an arrow where x equals 0 and y equals 0. So the capture arrow keys, uh, we need to have we need to turn that into a signal of user input. So we're going to base it on keyboard dot arrows. That's going to give us the uh, record of uh, x and y value, but we need to turn it into a sh into the correct shape, which in this case is our user input type. So we do that by popping into arrow. I'm going to do the same thing with spaces. Signal user input. We can use uh, keyboard dot space, which give us a signal of uh, boolean values, but that is, that's not the right shape for us. We need to put that into user input and space. So to do that, we have a little lambda that says pressed. So if pressed, if it's pressed, then give us a space. Otherwise, give me the default user input. And for our user input, oops, this is gonna be a merge of arrows and spaces. And for our game state, it's going to be not started or started. And our default, we're going to start with uh, not started. Once the game has started, though, we also need to know the state of the snake as well as the sherry. So for the snake, we need to know the position of its body segments, which is just going to be a list of uh, x and y coordinates, but we also need to know the direction that it's currently moving in. So we need to define what direction looks like, and we use a union type for that to say whether well, it's either be up, down, left, or right. And the default snake, we said earlier that we're going to have, uh, st we're going to start with eight segments for its body. And for each of these, we're going to turn that into an x and y coordinate as a tuple. So we're going to keep, it's going to start horizontal, so we're going to keep the y coordinate the same. But for every, but, uh, for every segment, we're going to move the body slightly, uh, slightly along the x axis. Oops. What did I just do there? Go back here. So we need to define how, we need to define the dimension for uh, the body segment. Let's make that 15 as well as the radius for the sherry segment dimension. And the snake is going to be moving in the direction to the right, which means that we also need to reverse this. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be uh, the, head, the, the head of the snake is going to be on the left-hand side in the middle. So we just need to reverse. Type sherry. Ah, right. Forgot the sherry type. So for the sherry, what do we need? Well, we're going to need the x and y coordinate to draw the to draw the circle. 
But since we don't always have a show on screen, so we make that a maybe, which just says that it's an option type of either some position or nothing at all. Next, let's draw something on the screen. So the background, we're going to need a background that covers the entire screen. We're going to fill that with the color black. And the content of the game is going to base is going to depend on the actual game state itself. So if it's not started, then we just uh, display some text to say, okay, press space to start. Uh, once the game has started, then we have the state uh, for the snake and the sherry. In which case, we need for each of the body segment of the snake. We need to turn that into a rectangle, uh, into a square that we can draw on the screen, and we know that each of the well, the segment is just a list of x y coordinates. So we draw a rectangle with the right dimensions, and we t make that yellow, and we're going to move it to the right position. And then, depending on the state of the sherry, if it's uh, well, if we if we have got a sherry that we need to draw, then we know the position of the of the uh, of the sherry. And we need to draw a circle there, sherry radius. And we make that white. And we're going to move it to the right position. But we also need to also return the segments uh, for the snake that we've done so far. On the other hand, if there's no sherry, then we just have to return the snake's, uh, the snake's bodies. Okay. And at the end, we're going to put everything in a collage by drawing the background first, then the content. OK. So nothing happens when I press space, because we are, we are not doing any state transformation yet. So we do that up here. So depending on the current game state, if it's not started, then the, if the user input is space, then we start the game. And we start the game with a default snake state and no sherry. Otherwise, no state to the game state, no change to the game state. OK, so now we join the snake. But once the game has started, we're not doing any transformations. So let's handle that case. Here we can actually use pattern matching to grab the different to grab the segments as a direction from the snake's uh, state. And we're going to first find out the new direction that we should be moving in. So to do some of that, I've got some helper function down below. So you don't have to just watch me type all day. Uh, this guy takes the user input and the current direction to give it back the new direction. And uh, to work out a new head position, I've got another function to say get the um, new segment, which takes the current position of the head and the direction that it's moving in. And for the tail, we said earlier that, OK, we're going to trim off the last segment of, uh, of his old body. So we're going to take everything except the very last element of the old body. And then for the new snake, we're going to surgically attach them back well, attach the new head segments equals the new head to the new body. And the direction is going to be moving in the new direction. We then also need to know the game over state. And I've got a function for doing that. But this function needs to know the, the bound, the, the dimension of the window, which is something that we're not capturing right now. So we just put a placeholder. So to, for us to continue, we need to also capture the window dimension, which is going to be width and height in integers. And to get that into our loop, we need to go back to where we are sampling the input. So in this case, we need to sample the input for the window dimensions, and then change our pattern match here to, to access the window dimension. So now, if the game over state, if it's game over, then we go back to the not started state. Otherwise, we progress 
the game with the new snake state and the sherry. So now we've got something that we can control, but there's no sherry on screen yet. So to spawn the sherry, we need to generate random numbers. And the way to do that in Elm is uh, you have to use for you have to use um, a seed. So whenever you generate new, uh, you to generate a new random number, you have to give it the current seed. It give you back the random number you want, as well as a new seed for the next time. So again, that's something we capture. We, now we are capturing it in our game state once the game has started, and what we need to do is. So we need to generate some random numbers. We need to generate three of them based on the current seed. But we haven't defined that yet. So when we first go into the, uh, when we first start the game, we need to initialize the seed. In this case, I'll just give you a 42 uh, good number. And uh, wherever we are here, so this function will give us back a list of uh, random, random numbers as well as a new seed that we need to use going forward. New seed. And in the drawing loop, we don't care about a seed, so we just un use underscore because we don't, care, we, don't need, we don't care what value it is. Of the three random numbers we generated, we use one to, to decide whether or not to spawn the sherry, if there's none there, as well as uh, uh, what x and y coordinate to put it in. So our new sherry state is now going to look like if the current sherry is nothing and our spawning chance is 20%, then we spawn a sherry given the current window dimension and the random x and y positions. Otherwise, no change to the sherry state. And we need to return for the next, for the new state, we need to return the new sherry state. Oops. So now we've got sherry on the screen, but our snake is not eating it. So the next thing we need to do is decide, do we eat the sherry? Which, if there's no sherry on the screen right now, then obviously we didn't. Otherwise, we get the position of the sherry, and we need to check if it's uh, overlapping with the new head position that the, of our snake. And if we just ate the sherry, then there's not going to be any sherry on the screen. Otherwise, we do what we did before. So our snake is eating the sherry now, but it's not growing. So just one more thing we need to do. So if we ate the sherry, we just have to leave the old body as it was, otherwise we trim off the last part before we put them back together. So now, as I eat sherries with my snake, ah, I'm not very good at this game, but I hope you're satisfied that snake is growing, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's it, uh, a very simple game of snake in about, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 minutes. And you can find the source code for, you can find the source code for that on the GitHub, as well as a very simple missile, uh, missile command game that I built with Elm a while back as well. And uh, you, for, if you want to start playing around with Elm, you don't have to download anything. You can just go to the website. You can use the online interactive uh, uh, environment to start writing some code and enable a debugger as well. So uh, some of the things I didn't quite like uh, from my experience with Elm so far, they're improving this, uh, but occasionally I still get these cryptic error messages that just sort of stumps me and go, whoa, what's going on there? Uh, there's also simple things that, no, there's errors that are so simple but has large uh, knock-on effects. And when you see the error messages, usually just you know, you, like a typo or somewhere. Uh, so the compiler messages, the compiler should be able to tell you more, more useful information when you, when you have uh, simple errors like that. 
But the big, big thing for me uh, that, think that makes me think that Elm's not ready for production right now is that it's still not version one. And uh, the last couple of releases they've done, they have been introducing breaking changes in every single one of them. In fact, the first time I've done this demo, um, about two days after I did a demo, they released a new version and with breaking changes. So I had to redo the demo just after that, which was, uh, which was a bit of a heartbreaking uh, experience for me. Um, when you have the debug enabled, keep in mind that every time you have a new value on your uh, that new thing that you want to draw on a screen, it records it gets recorded. So for a game like that, where you are drawing 20 frames a second or potentially even 60 frames a second, you are going to accumulate a lot of lots of events very quickly. And if you forgot to, de to stop the debugger, even though you can then just go back to the code section and make a code change and see what what happens to uh, to your you know, what, ha what what would happen to your state. You might find that a Chrome might just stall for the next 10 minutes because it's trying to re-render 20,000 frames that you've accumulated so far. So be, keep that in mind whilst you're doing debugging. And obviously, when that happens and you, you have, you've got code that you haven't saved, that's a very painful experience uh, to go through. So typically, what I would do is that if you install Elm locally, you can actually run the Elm reactor, which basically have a file watcher that watches your file, and uh, there's a, uh, there's a um, local host endpoint that you can hit and enable debugging and whatnot. So that way, as you're making code changes, every time you save, then you can enable auto reload, so it would then uh, reload, your, reload your code. And when things does get stuck, at least you can just close the browser without losing your code changes. But there's nothing stopping you from making interesting things. Uh, right now, most people are using Elm to make games. And, uh, and the best one I've seen so far is this uh, four, four page by the Firefly guys, who is uh, well known for in the Erlang and the Elixir community, which I think is uh, really well done and a really interesting use of a, of a game. Um, also, I know one guy, who, uh, right now I know one guy who's got an Elm application in production. It's a simple web app where you can uh, draw boxes and connect them together, uh, very like a sketch pad for you to put ideas down and connect them. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, thank you very much for listening. Um, even, okay, okay, I'm going to give you around for the rest of the day, so if you've got any questions uh, afterwards, feel free to come and ask me. And there's some uh, there's feedback link as well from the, uh, from the organizers. So yeah, thank you, and uh, if you've got any questions, Feel free to ask them. <laughs> sure. Yes, Yep, and HTML as well. So depending on what you're doing, for the stuff I was doing where it would just compile to uh, a JavaScript and uh, there's a, when you, when you compile it, there's an option for you to turn on to say, okay, also compile the HTML as well. But otherwise, you can just take the JavaScript and then embed it in your HTML code. All it is is just rendering on the canvas. But if you're building a web application using the HTML layout, uh, layout functionalities it has, then you can do the HTML for you. So what relationship does it have with uh, With uh, Hasco is built on top of the Hasco platform. Is it library? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but uh, it's borrowed a lot of the syntax from Hasco as well. And uh, so when you install Elm locally, you, uh, as part of that installation, you also install the Hasco platform. Yeah, I installed it with Kaba, so I saw it with Right, yep, yep. That's it. Yep. Uh, when you're using Elm Reactor, yep. to do uh, live code? Yep. Uh, with the live environment, used to prefer, uh, you, when you live updates, uh, it preserves your previous state, so you capture everything, but you will re-render it from the start. So if you make a change uh, to, I don't know, to the gravity value, for instance, you will re-render re all the frames that you just captured so far using the same keyboard, well, using the same set of inputs, like keep from the keyboard, for example. And that's when you're doing the, uh, the time-traveling debugger? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, they actually broke that in the last release. But before that, what happened is that you can. So as I was showing earlier, where I was doing the, I was handing the game state from not started to started, but the state gets stuck. Before the last release, what actually happened is, uh, okay, it throws exception, but it keeps your state. So by the time I implemented the started, the, uh, how to handle it from one started state to another started state, the, the game will just continue. The state will just continue on. Uh, they actually broke the last in the the last version. They actually broke that functionality, which I think right now they're fixing. But that's the way it's supposed to work. 
Yeah. Click one more question. Yeah. Um, the, they are float because the, the function that I need to use to draw them, they take float. Uh, but you can also just use a number which is uh, context sensitive so that it knows whether when to be integer, when to be float. But for me, I just want it to be simple and clear. Don't quite understand. You kind of pass the, the random seed in the beginning to the, yep. to the function with the cherry. Mm -hmm. And then depending on something, like the button matching, and then you, you redraw it or not. Right. Is there a way to say like uh, another signal like the others? Say oh, right. The cherry was eaten and then just redraw it. Yeah, so you, you probably could, but usually you want to keep everything that's part of your game state within one signal. Which is, which is what I've done. So in my, in my game state signal, for each game state, once it started, it has got a sherry. Does that answer your question? OK. Yeah, yeah, potentially you could. I mean, there's a number of different ways you can combine the signals together. I mean, for me, this is quite a straightforward way to, to, to do it. But once your application gets bigger and more complex, it makes sense for you to break your one big signal into smaller ones and then compose them in with different steps. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. In that case, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, feel free to come and grab me if you've got any more questions that you want to ask later on as well. <laughs>